How's everyone doing? It's Isaac Wade, Doctor of Pharmacy, and in this video, we'll be discussing everything you need to know about dutasteride, including how it works, how effective it is, common side effects, drug-drug interactions, and some of my own personal opinions about the medication. By the end of this video, you should have a better idea of whether or not dutasteride is something you'd want to talk to your provider with, so that ultimately, you can choose the best hair loss treatment for your situation. So without further ado, let's get right into it. First of all, let's talk about how dutasteride works. Dutasteride, like finasteride, inhibits the enzyme 5-alpha reductase, which prevents the conversion of testosterone into DHT, which as the evidence suggests, is the main cause of male pattern hair loss. However, unlike finasteride, which only inhibits two types of 5-alpha reductase, dutasteride inhibits all three types of the enzyme, leading to a more complete suppression of DHT and translating to better efficacy outcomes when the two are compared. But before we can discuss about efficacy, I need to be transparent in that dutasteride is not officially approved for treating male pattern hair loss. And the reason for this is because GSK, the company that discovered dutasteride, never ran any clinical trials on dutasteride for treating hair loss. The clinical trials they did run were for treating older men with prostate enlargement. And my guess is that prostate enlargement was probably the more profitable condition as prostate enlargement can lead to actual real medical problems, whereas male pattern hair loss is purely a cosmetic issue. So anyways, what this means is that much of the data that we have for dutasteride comes from older men being treated for enlarged prostate. And the way that dutasteride affects these men might not be the same as how it affects a younger man experiencing hair loss. Now with that out of the way, let's talk a little bit about how effective dutasteride is. A large network meta-analysis, which incorporated data from 23 separate studies, found that oral dutasteride was the most effective hair loss treatment out of all the heavy hitters in the hair loss game, including oral finasteride, topical finasteride, oral minoxidil, and topical minoxidil. So you can see that the evidence does point to oral dutasteride being the most effective treatment available. So now that we've talked a little bit about efficacy, let's talk about safety. When dutasteride was compared with finasteride in the aforementioned studies, we did see similar rates of side effects. But to have a better understanding of the true side effect profile of dutasteride, we need to take a look at the product monograph, which is the drug's official source of information that's put out by the manufacturer and reviewed by health officials. You can see in this document that common side effects in men treated with dutasteride for enlarged prostate included impotence with a 3% increase over placebo, decreased libido with a 1.6% increase, ejaculatory disorders with a 0.9% increase over placebo, and breast disorders with a 0.3% increase over placebo. Interestingly, dutasteride also seemed to have a noticeable impact on sperm parameters. In one study of 50 young men, where 27 men took dutasteride and 23 men took the placebo, it was observed that the dutasteride group experienced a reduction in sperm count, semen volume, and sperm motility by 23, 26, and 18% respectively. And although these changes were determined to be clinically insignificant, two of the men taking dutasteride experienced a whopping 90% decrease in sperm count. Although a partial recovery was seen in these men 24 weeks after discontinuation. Now the impact of dutasteride on male fertility is not completely understood, but I don't think we've seen such a common and such a dramatic effect of finasteride on sperm parameters. So if you're planning on having kids in the future and fertility is something that's important to you, finasteride would probably be the preferred option. Now let's talk a little bit about cardiovascular disease. And there have been some concerns about dutasteride increasing the risk for heart failure. However, this appears to be more of an issue when dutasteride is combined with the alpha blocker tamsulosin for treating a large prostate. And the risk of dutasteride causing heart failure on its own appears to be negligible. Next, let's talk a little bit about prostate cancer. And just like finasteride, dutasteride seems to decrease the overall risk of prostate cancer while increasing the risk of being diagnosed with a high grade, more severe prostate cancer. However, it's not clear if dutasteride actually increases the risk of high grade prostate cancer or if this finding is due to detection bias as dutasteride is known to shrink the prostate and a smaller prostate would make it easier to detect a high grade prostate cancer when biopsied. Either way, it's important to stress that the effect of dutasteride on prostate cancer is not completely understood and dutasteride is not approved for treating or preventing prostate cancer. Now let's talk a little bit about dutasteride and women. 
Just like finasteride, the use of dutasteride in women is contraindicated or definitely not recommended due to the risk of birth defects. Specifically, dutasteride, as with finasteride, likely causes feminization of the male fetus, resulting in genital defects such as a micropenis. And we know this because men that have a genetic deficiency where they lack the 5-alpha reductase enzyme often display ambiguous genitalia as well as fertility issues. And this is due to the important role that DHT plays in penile development in utero. But what about if a woman is exposed to dutasteride from the semen of a man during sex? Could this cause enough of a buildup of dutasteride in the woman's body that could possibly lead to birth defects? Let's talk about this. Now, the amount of dutasteride in semen was measured to be between 0.4 and 14 nanograms per milliliter after six months of daily dosing. Assuming the maximum amount of dutasteride in semen and a large ejaculation volume of five milliliters and 100% absorption from the vagina into the bloodstream, the maximum amount of dutasteride in the woman's blood would be 0 0.0175 nanograms per milliliter, which is roughly 100 times less than what we have observed to cause birth defects in animal studies. It's also important to note that dutasteride is highly bound to proteins in human semen, which should reduce the absorption of dutasteride into the woman during sex. Now, there was another study where pregnant rhesus monkeys were exposed to dutasteride of levels of up to 16 times greater than the maximum exposure a 50 kilogram woman would have if they had sex with a treated man every day. And in this study, there were no noticeable signs of feminization of the male baby monkeys. Nevertheless, there is a small theoretical risk of birth defects caused through this manner, which could be a concern based on your level of risk tolerance. So now that we've covered side effects, let's talk a little bit about the pharmacokinetics of dutasteride or how the body affects the drug. First of all, dutasteride is rapidly absorbed into the bloodstream with peak levels seen at one to three hours after dosing. Thankfully, food does not appear to have an impact on absorption of dutasteride, meaning that it can be taken with or without food. Now, once dutasteride is in the bloodstream, it binds strongly to blood proteins and distributes into other parts of the body as well. And because drugs are mainly eliminated from the bloodstream, these properties make dutasteride a drug that your body takes a very long time to get rid of. This leads to an extremely long half-life, which is the amount of time it takes your body to eliminate half of the drug. And in dutasteride's case, this ranges from three weeks in young patients to five weeks in older patients. Now, when it comes to metabolism, dutasteride is largely metabolized by CYP3A4 and CYP3A5 liver enzymes and excreted in feces. Dutasteride is minimally eliminated by kidneys, which is why you see so many people with renal failure taking dutasteride, no problem. However, drugs that inhibit the liver enzymes, CYP3A4 and CYP3A5, could potentially interact with dutasteride, leading to increased accumulation of the drug. Some common interacting agents include ketoconazole, ritonavir, verapamil, and ciprofloxacin, and also grapefruit juice. However, the increase in dutasteride seen from most of the interactions is unlikely to be clinically significant due to the excellent safety profile and wide therapeutic window of dutasteride. So now that we've talked about dutasteride from an objective data-driven perspective, I want to briefly talk about some of my own personal opinions about the drug. Now, first of all, I think dutasteride is a much better option for treating hair loss compared to experimental research chemicals, where quality control is an issue, you don't actually know what you're getting, and where there's hardly any human efficacy or safety data. There's never been any clinical trials on a lot of these uh, experimental chemicals. However, for most men who are just getting into hair loss treatments, Oral finasteride with or without topical minoxidil would still be my number one pick since these drugs have the most complete set of safety and efficacy data in human men suffering from hair loss. Then, you know, if you've tried uh, finasteride with or without topical minoxidil, with or without derma rolling, and you've been consistent with your treatments for about a year and you're still not satisfied with your results, then you can start thinking about taking uh, something off label, either switching from oral finasteride to oral dutasteride, or maybe switching from uh, topical minoxidil to oral minoxidil. Dutasteride would potentially cause more sexual side effects and oral minoxidil would potentially cause more uh, cardiovascular side effects.
And it's also important to note that it's gonna be up to what your provider feels comfortable with when it comes to prescribing drugs off label. You know, you can go up to your doctor and show them as many studies as you want, but not every provider is gonna feel comfortable prescribing you something that's not approved. But you're always free to see another provider, You'll see someone who's got a little bit more experience prescribing these types of drugs and who's gonna feel more comfortable. It's gonna be better to see one of those people rather than pressuring your current uh, provider. But anyways, that's all I have to talk about when it comes to dutasteride. Thanks so much for watching. I hope you found this video interesting and valuable, and I'll see you in the next one.